A story told a thousand ways cannot replace the truth of people living in the past whose bodies bear the truth. The mountains range, the willowed streams, the desert cliff of rock hold spirits that have lived its truth, a truth men want to block through history books that tell their side. The victor has its way, the beauty, not the ugliness that they used so they could stay. The land now gone from hands who cared and knew its gracious place to give and take in equal parts from Mother Earth's estate. The earth now cries. It's withered, dry, its story full of lies. The people brag and take and take and take and kill what once gave life. Their storybooks are filled with painted landscapes full of glee. They boldly call it progress and excuse the changing seas. They cut away the story that the buried left behind. But now it reaches from the earth a truth we all must find. We get to share in memories. She passed down to her grandson. The storyteller is his name. Shoshone are the ones. Their eyes peer through his mask of skin. Their memories of the right. A calling that he must fulfill to bring their truth to light. The storyteller opens up the truth of need and strength to listen to the past and gain their wisdom to make change. A change that holds earth precious as a suckling baby child whose milk is life and life without would take away its life. So listen to the stories from the dust of history's past. The dust of blood and sweat and tears and native bones at rest. The storyteller holds the words and native blood that gives the truth the story needs to show of all how we must live. Centuries ago, the smoke of the wigwam and the fires from the council meetings rose from every village. The young listened to songs and tales of bygone years. They listened and learned so that one day they might be able to repeat the same. The mothers took time to play with their children and taught them to love and appreciate the most simple joys of nature. The aged sat down with only memories of hunting and killing feasting, starving, and worshiping. Braver men never lived than the red man. Truer men never walked this land. They had courage and fortitude and perseverance. They shrank from no danger. They feared no hardship. Fear and danger and death were daily companions. They were taught to love each other and to be united in all things, and to be thankful for the favors that they received. They dare not pluck a flower, or a twig, or an herb or fruit, unless they ask permission from the Great Spirit through prayer. Little by little, though, the Indian is vanishing, vanishing into a society that you call civilization. He's trying to forget the wrongs done him and his forefathers. He's trying to forget that once his forefathers owned this great land and their seat extended from the rising sun to the setting sun. Only in memory can he recall the hunting of the bison, the deer and animals and other fowl, that these creatures were made for his use by the great spirit. He can remember that Mother Earth was created to produce corn and plants. He must try and forget the day when the white man crossed the great blue waters and landed on his land. He must remember that his 
forefathers who were friends to these people, not enemies. He must remember that he gave them a small seat. He must remember that his forefathers gave them corn and meat. He must forget in return for his kindness. His people were given poison. He must remember the strangers calling him brother and remember that they only wanted a larger seat. They wanted more land. They wanted everything. They wanted the whole country. He can only recall with great sadness when the pony soldiers gave his people desperately needed warm blankets, but blankets that had smallpox and thousands upon thousands of Indians died. He must try and forget the wrongs done to him and strive for better things. The Indian has been forced to leave his home, leaving behind the ashes of his native hearth. No longer does he see smoke curl around his wigwam. No longer does he stalk the deer and bison. No longer does he creep upon the fowls. No longer is he going up and down the stream looking for fish. Now he is told he has to have a license. No longer is his chant heard at night. No longer is loud wails heard at death. He must express himself in a different manner now. He has to wear shoes on his feet, feet that would rather roam in soft skins. He must cut his hair now because that is the way of the civilized man. He must wear his clothing even though his body cries for less clothing. He must eat food that makes his teeth soft. He is changing slowly. He is watching and waiting to see what effect civilization would have upon his people. Will civilization make them truer men, stronger men? The Indian is moving with a slow step, moving with an uneasy step. But before long, he will catch the pace of the white man and move as fast as he does. But first of all, the Indian must erase deep resentments and painful recollections that distract him. Only in memory can he see the deserted villages and cast a glance upon the graves of his forefathers. He sheds no tears, utters no cries or groans. There is sadness in his heart that surpasses speech. He is looking forward and going onward, but never for a moment will he forget that he is an Indian, a proud race, a race born with a spirit that cannot be enslaved, although his ways may change, his looks and thoughts will always be Indian. Just over 100 years ago, the Colorado River Commission signed the Colorado River Compact at Bishop's Lodge in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The commission included delegates from the seven Colorado Basin states and was chaired by Herbert Hoover. Do you know who wasn't there? More than 30 federally recognized Indian tribes of the Great Basin. You see, Manifest Destiny was never about land. It was always about water. Land without water in the West is pretty much useless. First in time, first in right, became the law of the land, unless you were Native American. What if the natives had been invited to the table? Would things be different today? Would the Colorado River and many of its tributaries and waterways be in the extreme crisis that we're in today if they were co-managed by indigenous peoples? I am the former chairman of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. 160 years ago, just barely, near the Utah-Idaho border, some 700 members of my tribe were spending their winters, as they had done for centuries, 
Hot springs nearby provided a welcome relief, respite from the long months of hunting and gathering. A half a mile to the southeast, Colonel Patrick Edward Connor and his California volunteers from Camp Douglas, Utah, had the same bird's eye view on that January morning in 1863. Without so much as asking the Shoshone for any guilty parties, Connor and his men began to fire their rifles and sidearms at the Shoshone people. The soldiers began massacring men, women, and children. My grandmother told me that our people were being slaughtered like wild rabbits. The massacre started early in the morning and lasted until mid-afternoon. The Bear River, which was slightly frozen earlier, was now starting to flow. Many of our people were jumping into this river to try to escape. The blazing white snow was now brilliant red with blood. The willow trees that were used as hiding places were now bent down as if in defeat. By early afternoon, more than 400 Shoshone people had died at the hands of civilization. In 2018, we were able to purchase 550 acres of that sacred burial ground known as the Bear River Massacre site. This was only the beginning of a journey that started a century and a half ago to tell our story from our unique perspective. My first visit the next day after the purchase was here to Utah State University to the Natural Resources Department. There I met with Chris Lukey and Mark Brunson. I told them I had a dream and a vision I wanted to restore the land to what it looked like in 1863, using my grandmother's plant diary as a guide. I wanted to know if it was feasible. And I knew well enough that I didn't possess the skill set to make that determination. But they did. Our first interaction more than four years ago has brought us where we are today. We have developed partnerships with you and the people here at this great university, the science communities here. As one professor told me recently, this will be a living learning classroom for decades to come. It requires more than removing invasive plants and species and planting new seeds. It involves restoring the watershed which will require buy-in from our neighbors upstream. How will they feel about the reintroduction of beaver in their ecosystem? Not very good, may I add. How will they feel about changing decades-old farming techniques and practices? How will they feel when we create riparian buffer zones? We will be moving Beaver Creek back into its original channel we will be putting more and cleaner water into the Bear River, which will eventually make its way to the Great Salt Lake, with the goal of reintroducing the Bonneville cutthroat trout in that Beaver Creek fishery. This is not a project that we could do alone. But healing begins when you bring people together. What we are doing at Bear River will not only symbolically, but literally have a long-lasting impact on not only the Bear River, but on the future of the Great Salt Lake and many other waterways in Utah. I am thankful every day for the teachings of my people. Mountains are sacred. They carry within their peaks and valleys the substance needed for life from the water running down into the streams and our valleys to the plants that are used and found there still today that were used as food and medicine to the animals we harvest to feed our families. My grandmother would tell me, slow down, ponder the lessons that are being taught. There is a great natural order to the universe of which man is a part. We have been endowed with the ability to observe, learn, and imitate this order 
It's a relationship of giving and taking, reciprocity. I believe today that ancient tribal cultures have important lessons to teach the rest of the world about the interconnectedness of all living things and the fact that our very existence depends upon the natural world that we seem to be destroying. Our environment and climate are changing. Native people have always possessed a profound spiritual kinship with nature. Pre-Columbus America was still our first Eden. Native people were transparent in this ecosphere. All of our decisions considered the effects of our actions on generations to come. We don't live in that space anymore, but we need to start for our children, our grandchildren, and those generations yet unborn. When Columbus and others entered this continent, it bore marks of thousands of years of human habitation and activity. As they moved inland, they continued to encounter settlements of recently abandoned agricultural landscapes, assisted by Indian guides and subsisting on native food. The pioneers at the head of Euro-American advance followed the signposts of cleared fields, orchards that have been recorded in the long experience of Native Americans in selecting good soil to manage these local ecologies. But Europeans began to alter these landscapes in ways that Native Americans could never imagine before. Yet in spite of all of this, we have survived, and in some cases thrived. Our ability to adapt to a changing world and landscape has allowed us to still be here. I want you to know that our languages are still strong. Ceremonies that we've been conducting since the beginning of time are still being held. Our governments are still surviving. And most importantly, we continue to exist as a distinct group, as sovereign nations in the midst of the most powerful country in the world. We've had a history that has contributed significantly to not just the United States, but to the world. There are not that many Native Americans in the world today, and I'd say we tend to get overlooked in many ways. And when we are not overlooked, we tend to be misrepresented. History on occasion has reduced my people to one-dimensional characters, important only in the sense that we taught the pilgrims to grow corn. But we're much more than that. Our voices have been quiet for a long time. And in some cases, we are still searching for that identity again. But we still have much to contribute. We know that the earth and all of its creations came into being by the hands of the Great Spirit as the designer and creator. The Great Spirit put into place finely tuned systems cycles and physical parameters that would always sustain life. We were given careful instruction to take care of it. We are caretakers, not owners, a distinction that is often misunderstood today. The lands have always belonged to the creator and not to us. We have been instructed to not overuse the land and allow it to rest during certain times. The Creator expects us to sustainably manage the resources that we have. We have been instructed to leave an inheritance for those yet to come. The lands that colonizers first put their eyes on were not untouched or wild, as has been recorded by some but rather the result of a broad range of indigenous land management techniques. In the late 1800s, John Muir said that the Indians walked softly and hurt the landscape hardly more than a bird or squirrel. And as a result, 
The land that Europeans first arrived to look at was rich and fertile, organized and well tended. Our people did not struggle against nature. They worked within the set bounds and out of a spirit of respect. We took no more than we could use and used all that we could from what we took. Always making sure that we put the time and energy back into the land so that Mother Earth would continue to yield year after year for generations to come. We have always believed, as you should, that the Great Spirit put everything on this earth for our survival. Nature needs to be tended and carefully and lovingly maintained to be respected and not dominated. The natural resources on this earth will continue to produce year after year, but only when our steps are light and our hearts are right. But things have changed. How do we reconcile the past where Western values teach us that we all have rights? we can use the land for extraction and depletion versus indigenous values that I've been taught my whole life that says we have obligations, obligations to the past, obligations to the present and future, obligation to our communities. Western worldviews are often scientific and skeptical often requiring proof for belief. Indigenous worldviews say that they were based on a spiritually orientated society. This is a system that has a belief in the spirit world. To native people, land, water, plants are spiritual. Western worldviews say that there is only one truth based on science or law. Indigenous worldviews say that there can be many truths. Truths are dependent upon individual experiences. Western worldviews has a way of compartmentalizing society. Indigenous worldviews say that societies operate in a state of relatedness. Everything and everyone are related. Identity comes from those connections. Western worldviews say that the land and the water and its resources should be available for extraction and depletion and development. Indigenous worldviews look at the land and water as something that is sacred and only is given to us by a creator to be carefully and lovingly maintained. Western worldviews judge your success by how well you achieve your goals. Indigenous worldviews judge your success by the quality of your relationships with each other. Western worldviews say that human beings are the most important thing in the world. Indigenous worldviews say that human beings are not the most important thing in the world. And Western worldviews teach us that amassing wealth should always be for personal gain. Indigenous worldviews say that amassing wealth is important, but only for the good of the community. Do you know that the Iroquois Nation doesn't make any decision without considering what effects that decision would have on seven generations ahead? Think about the implications of our future if our leaders governed that way. There's an old Native American proverb that says, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. What kind of world are we leaving them? What will their world look like? A scientist once said, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 good years of science, 
we could solve and address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. But we've got to start making decisions that will allow our environment to heal. We can all be involved in organizing land restoration activities that will build resiliency to drought. One way to do that, as my beaver loving people tell me, is to slow, sink, and spread water over the landscape, restoring beaver habitat and the health of the upper watershed riparian areas is a promising approach. The restoration efforts that we're doing at Bear River are good examples of this and serve as models for restoration efforts across the country. We are using our water rights, which are senior water rights on the Bear River, to restore Beaver Creek and riparian habitat along the Bear River. We are ensuring greater flows to the Great Salt Lake. Proposed legislation is always a good start but we need to stay organized, keep up the political pressure to get this and other legislation across the finish line. The monster in the room, though, is climate change. Who knows? We must increase political pressure for climate legislation that immediately reduces greenhouse gases this can take the form of transforming our food production, the way we manage our land and energy industries and transportation. But we need to come to terms with our culture of consumption, extraction, and depletion. Can this be done? This past October, I went to Copenhagen, Denmark for eight days gave a talk similar to tonight, an indigenous perspective for climate and environment. It was well received, although they didn't say much after the lecture, which I thought was kind of weird. They entertained me for eight days, however, and the real learning took place at dinner every night, where I went to dinner with a different professor with 10 of his grad students. And there I got grilled on American values. And they can drink beer like nobody's business. <laughs> I had the opportunity to sit at their feet and listen. What I got out of those discussions and sessions that went well into the night is that these people already live these indigenous values. They live sustainably. Their water and air are clean. They walk or bike everywhere, which isn't really feasible for us. I asked them why they're listed as the happiest people in the world every year. And a girl said, it's simple. We have free health care. We have a home to rest our head. And we all have jobs. We have clean air and clean water. Why wouldn't we be happy? We need to change our thinking and consider the health of not only the people, but the health of our environment and the watersheds that nourish our lakes and rivers and human, non-human kinfolk. My grandmother always referred to our plants and animals and water as kinfolk. That taught me to value those things differently. The health of the people will always parallel the health of our watersheds and the health of our environment. You see, scientists are finally discovering what indigenous elders have been teaching for generations, that all things are connected. 
politicians are finally discovering what the Iroquois nation already knew, that we must govern for our future generations. That's what young activists are saying when they demand climate justice. We cannot sacrifice the future for the sake of short-term profits. There is not enough science in the world that will overcome our selfish behaviors. Remember that. One day a hunter brought home a sizable kill, far too much to be eaten by his family. A mountain man nearby said to the hunter, how are you going to store the excess? Because drying and storing technologies were well known at the time. The hunter looked puzzled, but he looked at the mountain man and said, store the meat, why would I do that? Instead, the hunter sent out an invitation for the whole village to come together and enjoy a great feast. At the conclusion of the evening, as everyone left, bellies full, tired of dancing and singing, satisfied, the mountain man was really bothered by now. And he again approached the hunter and said, given the uncertainty of fresh meat in the forest, it would have been smarter for you to share the excess and save it for your family for future use. The hunter looked at him again and said, store the meat? I store the meat in the belly of my brother. As we become successful by today's standards, can I make one suggestion? I hope that our status in this life will not be determined by how much we accumulate, but by how much we give away and how much we do to serve each other in our individual communities. We know what to do. We know what the problem is. We know the drivers of climate change. We know all of these things, but yet we fail to act. You want to know why? We fail to act because we haven't incorporated values and knowledge together. Now is the time to braid indigenous and scientific knowledge to manage our environment in ways that we achieve our conservation goals and support indigenous sovereignty as well. There are a growing number of cases that illustrate how to operationalize this knowledge building in the context of indigenous-led restoration efforts. Tribes are doing this all over the country. When you assume that scientific knowledge is superior in any way to indigenous wisdom, you make collaboration impossible. And that is what we're going to need. I believe we're in the midst of a massive paradigm shift I believe now is the time to braid together indigenous knowledge and values about stewardship with cutting edge science and create governance institutions that will steward our water and our environment and our climate for the next few generations. These are indeed difficult times, but what brings me hope is that thousands of people are finally coming together to say that our human being is connected to the well-being of our environment. And the well-being of our environment is connected to the well-being of the watersheds and climate. We are truly all connected. And the actions that we take in this next decade will determine what we're going to have in the future. Let's stay active, let's stay engaged, and keep coming together to protect and steward our environment and each other. You know, the world as we know it has ended for many things, many times, 
But in this era, in this time, this now, is never before known time to create, to investigate, to listen and to invent. And not because we have all the answers, not because we know the way, but precisely because we don't. I don't know how to fix the problems alone. But I believe that abundance sprouts up in strangely improbable places. What I do know is that I will be fighting alongside you for many foreseeable years, and I hope you will too. There's a certain poppy that gets its germination cues from smoke after the devastating wildfires in California in 2019. The hills that were black with ash are now lined with these beautiful golden poppies. Similarly, we are all born to bloom, not in spite of the fire in our lives, but because of the fire. Our creator, with this problem that we have today, needs us on fire. Let me end with my favorite chief, Crazy Horse. I believe he was a prophet. Right before he passed away, he had a dream, and his interpreter wrote down the dream and shared it with the world. You tell me if he didn't see our day and time when he said, upon suffering beyond suffering, the red nation shall rise again, and it shall be a blessing to a sick world. A world filled with, bro with broken promises, selfishness, and separations. A world that is longing for light again. I see a time of seven generations when all the colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life and the whole earth will become one circle again. In that day, there will be those among my native peoples who will carry knowledge and understanding of unity among all living things. And the young white ones will come to those of my people searching for this wisdom. I salute the light in your eyes where the whole universe dwells. For when you are at that center within you and I am in that place within me, we shall be as one. I think the words of Crazy Horse are prophetic. Like many Native American leaders who went before and what I believe many Native American leaders who will come again. We carry this light. Let us share it with you. I saw a cartoon. I have to tell you, that was the end, by the way. But I saw a cartoon. <laughs> Two white guys standing there. And the one guy says to him, what if this climate change talk is all a big hoax? And we end up creating a better world for nothing. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. Thank you very much for the time.